There are millions of people enslaved in human trafficking throughout the world today, most in plain sight. Through education, awareness, and activism, we can end slavery in our lifetime. Wichita, Kansas, the largest city in Kansas and known to be the air capital of the world. By day, it's a place where businessmen and women thrive. But by night, the law of the street takes over. Human trafficking in Wichita is different than human trafficking in Dodge City or human trafficking in New York City or human trafficking in, in other countries. Every, uh, every community has their own unique um, dynamics uh, involved in that. I will learn out here, women are bought and sold like slaves. She um, drops me off at a hotel for crack and he gave her the bag of crack. I remember him and it was a hotel room off Broadway. At this time I lived here in Wichita. He just came out of the bathroom. My mom left me there. You know, I was 11 or 12. Like he comes out and he's taking his belt off. So I'm like, this is not good. You yes. sex for the drugs that she had. Yes. And, um, and he's like, get up there and lay down. And I'm like, well, no, I'm, you know, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, and I'm thinking of everything that I can to, you know, prolong him from doing what he's going to do. I remember looking at the front door, wondering if it had a lock on it that I had to unlock. And this whole time, I'm planning how to get out. Yeah. And I take off out the front door, and he tries to take off after me, and I'm, I'm gone. I disappear. Eventually, I found my way home. And she comes home two days later, I, like nothing happened. Like I was, like she left me there at the apartment, like nothing even happened. You know, like she, and at this point, I knew that my mom was not my mom anymore. This happens to more than 100,000 girls right here in our own country. Yeah, he was actually my drug dealer. I was actually abused by my dad as a child. Um, they were selling drugs out of my garage, they were selling drugs out of my basement. I was molested for 10 years almost by my father. And I've been using meth since I was 15 years old. I made sure to stay friends with the guys that dealt the drugs so that I wouldn't have to pay for my drugs. Pimps prey on vulnerable girls, lure them in with promises of love and money. The average girl entering the commercial sex trade is between 12 and 14 years old. I was introduced immediately to prostitution. They're often sold out of sight inside hotels or private residence, arrangements made over the phone or the internet. These girls are all but in prison. Intimidated and very fearful for my life and um, my life changed at, the at that time dramatically. And it's, sad, it's a sad thing to walk in and even see their pimps down there on video visitation still still drilling them. They're still controlling them. They're drilling them. You know, I, I can walk by and hear them threatening them. From a business point of view, it all makes sense. The girls are the commodity. They can make a pimp hundreds of thousands of dollars a year by sleeping with as many as 20 or more men a night. Young girls can make them even more. Then there are the Johns, the men responsible for driving the demand. They are from every walk of life. What else can I do? You know, first thing I ask them, do you even have your high school diploma? Most of them is no. For a young girl trapped in the life, escaping from a watchful pimp can be impossible without help. It's not, it's not always gonna come out in the referral, admit sheet, you know. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. The, the, one of the moments that sticks out in my mind is a conversation I had with a, a young woman and she proceeded to tell me about a situation when she was in Kansas City. I knew she was from Kansas City, but I didn't know she was being trafficked by her boyfriend. Wow. Some estimates say 100,000 girls or more are trafficked in America from every state to get their mindset changed to where they can go to, say, McDonald's and get a check and know that you're okay. That's gonna take some training. Exactly. You know, because that fast money is a hard thing for them to break. And there were two things that kept popping up. One was homes that were safe and secure. 
that they would have a place of safety that they could come and be at and in uh, in turn learn new things in life and new ways of living and then the other uh, was for mentors people who would make a decision to open up their hearts their homes their lives and walk with these young women uh, for extended periods of time a study shows close to 90 percent of women working the streets say they would leave if they only had a place to go nine out of ten the girl's first step to get off the streets was here a place called women's recovery Deborah lets me sit in on a group session where today girls as young as 21 talk about their experiences with addiction, abuse, and trafficking. What was so disturbing to me was each one of these girls started at such a young age. For obvious reasons, we have to hide their identity. 23, the first time I didn't, I wanted it bad enough, I didn't have anything to pay for it, and I had a good friend that, um, so yeah, I'll give you something come in here with me. I'm in the bathroom and he, um, I had to do something sexual for it. And at first I was appalled, but I sat there and did it anyway and cried through the whole thing. I have three beautiful kids. One of them is the product of rape um, that almost took my life in fact. I was um, exchanging sex for drugs. Every year, thousands of girls across the United States go missing running from broken families or abusive homes. With no place to go and nothing to eat, it's all too easy for a pimp to gain her trust. Many stay trapped forever. Only some, a very few, get the help they need to break free. Human trafficking exists all over the country, all over the world, but definitely it is occurring right here in Wichita, Kansas, and in every Midwest city and, and town across the United States of America. And oftentimes, the bondage, the binding, the captivity is, is really occurring because a perpetrator, someone with more power or control or privilege, has, has taken over the mind and the heart of another person. Wichita Police has worked more than 150 human trafficking cases involving minors since 2006. 200 million worldwide human trafficking effects. It's a $32 billion industry worldwide. Um, actually, my first introduction to human trafficking and, and the terrible impact of it was when I was living in Istanbul, Turkey, and loved, loved the city, loved the beautiful water, and I found out through a direct message that they had the largest international port and they were actually shipping um, human trafficking victims in containers. So those huge ships I was watching go down that beautiful blue water. So fascinated a girl from Kansas seeing that. But there was actually people in there. Trafficking, pimping, and buying sex are all crimes because it's easier to see the girls in action. They tend to be the ones that get punished. Prosecuting pimps and johns requires the girls' testimony, and many won't talk of fear of their pimps. All too often, the men walk away. I think that uh, this is something that we can work toward, and, and we'll just need to find some champions in the legislature that will invest themselves in stepping out and addressing this. With no health care, shelter, food, or support, most of these women will stay prisoners of their environment. We're an organization that cares for those who are disadvantaged. Uh, they don't have an opportunity to receive the health care that they truly need. And one of the core areas that we're finding is uh, we have human trafficking on the streets of Wichita and in Sedgwick County in general. So it's really important for our associates to be able to um, identify and offer appropriate assistance because that might be the only window of opportunity. There are studies that indicate that almost 88% of victims of trafficking come in contact with some type of healthcare professional while they're being trafficked. One of the girls told me, and I will never forget this, when I was in the safe house in Romania, she said, Deronda, I know you want to help them in the aftercare portion after they've been rescued, but if you can please focus somewhat on prevention as well. She said, by the time we get them here and they're rescued, yes, they're rescued, but they're broken. And there's only so much that can be done. But if you can get out there and spread the word and do some prevention work. And so I came back with that really piercing my heart. 
So it takes a bunch of broken systems and communities that really roll out a red carpet for the women to find their way into being runaways, to being trafficked, to being addicted, to being jailed, to being prostituted. So it makes sense that it takes communities to welcome the women home and provide the resources and provide a place to restore all of us into a community together. Don't give up. It's all worth it in the end because like, without those experiences in my life, I would not be the person I am today. Building my community and my recovery community has been the most important thing to me. Um, they have helped me in so many ways, helped me stay sober and led me to God, you know, they led me. A group of drunks in recovery led me to God. Treat this young woman or these young women as if they're your daughter. If it was my girl, I wouldn't rest. I wouldn't stop. I would go to the ends of the earth to see her rescued and restored. And we are called to go to the ends of the earth to rescue and restore.